Good morning. How's everyone doing? I've got a little talk here, um, continuing with our theme of homeostasis. And in this talk, we're going to talk a little bit about temperature regulation. So we've got some very important definitions that I want to go over to start with. And this may be the most important part of the talk because these definitions are, are used all the time, but we, we've got to be very clear on what they mean. So we've got uh, poikilotherm and homeotherm. Okay, so poikilotherm is an organism whose body temperature can vary. And homeo, you know, homeo means same. So a homeotherm is an organism whose body temperature remains constant. And a lot of times people might use the terms uh, cold-blooded or warm-blooded here. We've got two other terms that I want you to know. Ectotherm and endotherm. So, ectotherm means the organism gets their heat from the environment, whereas an endo, you know, endo means inside, endotherm means the organism creates its own heat. Now, a lot of times these terms are used interchangeably. You know, you might say cold-blooded poikilotherm or ectotherm, or you might say warm-blooded homeotherm, endotherm but they're not technically the same. So cold blood and warm blooded, those are just kind of common terms that we use. We're not gonna use those too much, but poikilotherm, homeotherm, ectotherm, endotherm, if you study these definitions, they have a slightly different meaning. Um, one, you know, the first has to do with whether or not your body temperature can, can vary or not. And then the other, these two terms, talk about where you get your temperature from. And so that's kind of two different things. So I want you to be careful when you use these, these terms. Now, most poikilotherms are all, and that's why we tend to use these terms interchangeably. And most homeotherms are, and so that's why the, these terms kind of slip and, and, and are used interchangeably, but technically they're not interchangeable. So for example, can you name a homeothermic ectotherm? Think about it. What does it mean? Homeothermic means the body temperature doesn't vary, but ectotherm means they get their heat from outside their body, from the environment. So for example, say you had a fish that lived in the ocean near the equator, right? Fish are ectotherms. Uh, there are species of fish that, that do uh, have a constant body temperature and produce their own heat, which is very cool. But in general, most fish get their heat from the environment, which makes them an ectotherm. But if this fish lives in an environment that doesn't vary, like at the equator, its, it's body temperature would not vary. So it's a homeotherm. See? Uh, what about a poikilothermic endotherm? Can you think of one of those? Well, again, what does each term mean? Poikilotherm means the body temperature varies. Endotherm means the organism creates their own body heat. So for example, think of something like a, um, a hibernating bear, right? It's an endotherm. Bears are mammals. They create their own heat. But when they hibernate, their body temperature drops quite a bit. So that's why it's, you know, it's good to be precise with these terms. Now, there's another... Um, just common thing that, that people talk about with temperature regulation, and it's called Bergman's rule. And that is that endotherms get larger as you move toward the poles. So as you move away from the equator, the endotherms get larger. Why? And in general, you can also probably argue the opposite, that ectotherms get larger as you go toward the equator. Again, why? Well, I'm not going to answer that. I'm going to let you guys think about that one. That would be a good test question. Okay, so we're talking about regulating temperature, and there's many strategies. And so, for example, this figure from your book shows something called behavioral thermal regulation, meaning just by changing your behavior, you can change your body temperature. And so um, this lizard buries itself in the sand in early morning because in early morning and night the air gets really cool but the sand holds heat so by burying yourself you can uh, take heat you know you can stay warm if you were not buried 
they'd get too cold. Then when the sun comes out, the temperature is just about right, so they, they, the lizard comes out. Then during midday, it's too hot, so it goes and hides, you know, in the shade. And then in late afternoon, you're back in, in the sun. Um, so this also shows to you know that poikilotherms, ectoderms, also regulate their temperature. So just because your temperature can vary, doesn't mean that it has to vary that much. And so the the poikilotherm here in this example is doing something to try to keep its body temperature you know somewhat uh, constant now here's another hot environment but how does an endotherm what are some of the, the things an endotherm can do and again you know can do behavioral things like just find shade and not move when it gets very hot there's lots of other little things that organisms can do uh, for example again you know, endotherms tend to be homeotherms, but you do see some that can allow their body temperature to vary a little bit. And so, for example, this particular organism lets its body cool down at night, and so allows its body temperature to cool down as uh, the sun goes down. And so then when it starts to get hot in the morning, it takes longer for their body to reach a sweatable temperature for lack of a better word. And so that's just another little strategy that, that an organism might use in a very hot environment. These are just different examples of, you know, there's lots of ways you can regulate your temperature. Uh, another thing that, that organisms can do in a hot environment is put all their fat into a hump. So put all their fat in one spot instead of all around the body. Fat is a good insulator. And so if you've got fat a layer of fat all around the body that's going to hold in all that body's heat but if you concentrate that fat just in a hump then the heat can radiate out in other places and so that's why you see organisms that have you know that live in hot environments often have a hump that's one reason it's the same thing as it's it's like you know if you have your you know the blankets covering your whole body which keeps you very warm or you take that blanket and you wad it up and you just put it over your feet, right? You're not going to be as warm. It's the same idea. You've got the same amount, you've got the same blanket or the same amount of fat, but in a smaller area. Um, of course, if you've got dogs, you're familiar with changes that occur, uh, again, in, in a endothermic homeotherm. When it gets colder, you know, they put on their winter coat, right? The fur gets thicker or they put on more fat. These are things to help insulate and, and retain body heat. Um, something else that you see in mammals and in, uh, in other organisms, the extremities are not well insulated, right? So in this example, in this wolf, you know, the, the legs don't have as much fur on them, and that's pretty typical. So they're not as well insulated, so they tend to lose heat. Also those legs stick out, they've got a higher surface area to volume ratio, right? You've got a lot of surface area for a small volume, and so you've got a lot of places where heat can radiate out. So the extremities tend to lose a lot of heat. And so what you'll find is the blood vessels are arranged in a countercurrent fashion in order to retain heat. Now we've talked about countercurrents before, but let's talk about them in more detail because they are fascinating and important. We talked about it when we talked about the kidneys. And you had two fluids, fluids, <laughs> fluids, 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 two fluids flowing in opposite directions to each other. And that allows you to maximize exchange between the two fluids. So in the kidney, it was to maximize water uptake into the blood. But in this example, it's to maximize heat retention in the body. And so this is our kidney diagram again. And you've got blood that sort of flows in the opposite direction of the urine. That sets up a countercurrent, which allows you to draw more water out of the urine and back into the blood. And these countercurrents work because there's always a concentration gradient across the membrane. And as long as there's a concentration gradient, water and solutes will move, right? Things will diffuse down their concentration gradient.
So a good example of this, again, let's go back to fish, because what do I do? I always go back to fish, but it's fine. It's, it's this, this example works for all these things. But fish is a good, way to, a, a good starting point to describe countercurrent. Fish need to take up oxygen at their gills, right? There's oxygen in the water. Fish need to get oxygen from the water into their blood. And so they want to maximize that. They want to get as much oxygen as possible. And so if we look here and dial in on the, the anatomy of fish gills, so this is kind of zoomed in on a fish gill a little bit. You've got what are known as primary lamellae, which looks kind of like a, a, the wing of a plane. And then you've got uh, secondary lamellae that go off of that. And then there are capillaries, very thin blood vessels in those lamellae. And that's where uh, oxygen exchange takes place. That's where the oxygen goes from the water into the blood. And this is where you've got a countercurrent set up in order to maximize that oxygen uptake. So let me show you what would happen. So imagine that we zoomed way in on that gill. And so we're at right at the interface of the water and the blood, right? So we've got these, those gills are very thin, capillaries are very thin. So it's basically like you've got the blood on one side of a membrane and water on the other side. And this is where we're going to exchange gases. And so let's say that, that here at the gills, our starting situation is like this. So wh when I've got PO2, that's the partial pressure of oxygen. It's basically how much oxygen is dissolved in the water. Let's say it's 100%. It's saturated with oxygen. The water is. But if you look in the blood, the PO2 is zero. There's no oxygen in the blood. Well, that's because this blood is coming from the body it's going to the gills to pick up oxygen, right? That's what happens, is that the blood goes to the gills, picks up oxygen, and carries the oxygen to the rest of the body. So that's why you've got this concentration gradient. The water's got tons of oxygen, the blood's got no oxygen. Well, what's going to happen? Simple diffusion, like we've always been talking about, right? You've got a high concentration of oxygen on one side of the membrane and a low concentration on the other side. And so oxygen is going to diffuse from high to low. But once the concentration is equal on both sides of the membrane, then the net diffusion stops, right? Remember, it's, it's a dynamic equilibrium. Oxygen is still moving back and forth, but you've got no net movement. So the best you can do is to get half of the available oxygen that's in the water, right? Once you take half of the oxygen and it diffuses into the blood, now the concentration is equal. And so now there's no net movement. Well, that's not good enough. There's still lots of oxygen in the water that the fish would like to have. So what, what can the fish do to get more of that oxygen? Well, what we're looking at is, in this example, you just got water and blood just sitting next to each other. Well, that's not very realistic because, you know, the blood is constantly being pumped so the blood is moving and the fish is swimming all the time or it's at least sucking water through the gills so the water is also moving so instead of water and blood being static and sitting next to each other they're in real life they're moving so what happens well let's say that they're moving but they're moving in the same direction so the blood is being pumped one way and as the water is sucked through the gills it also moves in the same direction. We would call this a concurrent mechanism. They're moving in the same direction. So now, you know, we've got, we start on one side and the water and blood move together to the other side. And so when we start on the left of this picture, that's blood coming from the tissues. And so that, again, it it's, doesn't have any oxygen because all the oxygen was used up by the cells. The water is coming into the gill chamber and it's got 100% oxygen, right? So we have that same concentration gradient at start, but now they're moving next to each other. And so as the water and the blood move, oxygen diffuses into the blood. And so oxygen diffuses out of the water. So you see the oxygen level in the water is going down and the oxygen level in the blood is going up. And the water and blood keep moving. They're sort of moving along with each other. But what's gonna happen? You're gonna end up the same way as if they weren't moving, right? Because once enough oxygen moves out of the water into the blood, to make those concentrations equal, 
now there's no net movement again. So even though the water and blood are moving like they do in real life, we're just like our first example. We still leave a lot of oxygen in the water and the, the fish wants more oxygen. But what if we simply reversed the flow of one of these? So instead of them moving in the same direction, the blood is moving in one direction and the water is moving in the opposite direction. That is a counter current. Now what happens? So now again, look at the starting point here. The blood is coming in from the right on this picture and its oxygen level is zero. It's coming from the tissues and it's flowing right to left. The water is coming into the gill chamber and it's full of oxygen but it's coming it's running from left to right so you see the water's got a hundred percent and so as these move past each other what happens to the oxygen well we can fill this in all the way and then you can imagine what happens so for example follow the water coming into the gill chamber it comes in with a hundred percent oxygen the blood that it's next to has ninety percent oxygen so there's still a concentration gradient right so oxygen is still higher in the water, so it's going to move into the blood. And so if you follow the water, you see now the water is at 90% oxygen. It's lost some oxygen. But the blood, it's, it's different blood that it's across from now. The blood it's across from only has 60% oxygen. So there's a concentration gradient. So water or oxygen is gonna flow from the water into the blood. Now, keep following the water. Now the water only has 60% oxygen because it lost more oxygen. But compare it to the blood. This is different blood. It's always different blood because they're moving in different directions. And the blood that it's across from now only has 30% oxygen. So there's still a concentration gradient. So oxygen moves from the water to the blood. And so now the water has very low oxygen. But the blood has even lower oxygen. So you still I have oxygen move from the blood, from the water to the blood. And so simply by reversing the flow, you're able to extract a lot more oxygen. So if you look at when the water leaves the gill chamber, it only has 30 or 20% oxygen. And if you look at the blood leaving and heading back to the, the fish's body, now it's got like 90% oxygen. So by simply making a countercurrent mechanism, we were able to more efficiently extract gas from the water. And so this is, this is the idea. And so you can imagine how, you know, a simple mutation, natural selection, tinkering with something, simply reversing the flow of a couple of things can be a huge advantage. And, and so we see these countercurrents in a lot of ways. And so this was oxygen uptake. And, and again, why does it work? By countering the flow, we get a lot more oxygen in the blood. There's always more oxygen in the water than the blood in the countercurrent mechanism. So oxygen is constantly diffusing into the blood. And so if you look closely at this diagram of gill anatomy, you can see the arrows. You can see the big black arrows showing the direction of water flowing. And you can see the little dotted arrows showing the direction of blood flowing. And you see that they're flowing in opposite directions to each other. Cool. Now here we look at our picture of a kidney again. And you can see the countercurrent and how it works in this kidney. The urine is flowing one way in the nephron you know, it down in the descending loop of Henle, whereas blood is flowing in the opposite direction. There's our countercurrent. And so no matter what, there's always more solutes in the blood than in the urine. So water is always going to diffuse out of the urine and into the blood because of this countercurrent. And so now let's go back to the appendage on the wolf where we're looking at temperature retention and temperature exchange. Um, but we're still looking at a countercurrent. And so you see that the blood from the body, which is warm, is flowing down toward the toes and it's laying right next to the blood coming back from the toes, which are going to be cool. All right. So heat coming from the warm body is always flowing next to the cold blood. Remember that, you know, why is the blood from the toes cold? Because the high surface area to volume, the low insulation, the appendages are losing heat. But because that cold blood is flowing in a countercurrent fashion to the warm blood, the warm blood, you know, the, the blood in, 
coming from the body, it's always higher than the blood coming from the toes. So heat is always going to flow into that blood that's heading back from the toes. And so the heat gets retained in the blood before it makes it all the way down to the toes. And so this is just a way to retain that valuable body heat instead of losing it down at the toes. Of course, you're, you're losing some at the toes, but you're not losing nearly as much. And it's simply by putting a countercurrent mechanism in those blood vessels. Okay, uh, there's other, of course, of course, there's other ways. If you're cold, you can warm up. Um, shivering exercise, again, exercise would be like behavioral thermal, thermal regulation. Shivering is sort of un, unconscious, but again, your, your um, increasing chemical reactions, which is going to release heat. And if you, you increase your metabolism even more, that's... Um, another way to increase heat in the cells okay and so by cranking up your metabolism you can also warm up your body if you need to now this becomes a problem if you're a small animal if you're small of course you have a very high surface to area volume ratio and remember the surface area to volume ratio is all about exchange and if you've got a high surface area to volume ratio you lose your heat rapidly right you, you can't hold on to your heat as well as if you're a big organism and so small animals are always losing this heat if they're trying to warm up but they can't they, they create this heat but they can't hold on to the heat and so they're constantly having to replace lost heat well how do you replace lost heat you know you eat and you crank up your metabolism but that means that you have to eat a lot and so small animals are often just a few hours away from starving and they have to eat all the time because if they're trying to to maintain a certain body temperature you have to metabolize you know break down food but as soon as you break down food and you get a little bit of heat but then you lose that heat so you have to eat a little bit more and then you lose that heat and you have to eat a little bit more and so on right and so then if it's you know if it's cold outside and you're trying to you have to create even more heat to keep yourself warm this can be very dangerous and so um, this tends to limit how small an animal can be and at some point an organism organisms get too small to be able to retain the heat that they produce and so that's why there's a, a minimum limit to endothermy like you can't be uh, uh, endothermy and homeothermy. Like if you get too small, your surface area to volume ratio is just too high and you can't maintain your body temperature. And so these are probably some of the smallest endotherms that you're gonna find, right? The pygmy shrew and the bee hummingbird. These are endotherms and they're homeotherms for the most part. So they produce metabolic heat but they lose it right away because of their high surface area to volume ratio. So they need to produce more metabolic heat to keep their body temperature up, but that gets lost right away. So they're constantly having to eat all the time. Any animal that's smaller than this simply would not be able to eat enough. There's just not enough energy out there. And so that's why um, you, know, you see endothermy and homeothermy more in larger organisms, things like small organisms like insects, are all poikilothermic ectotherms because they just couldn't eat enough because of their high surface area to volume ratio. Now, some small endotherms um, actually, again, because it's so hard to maintain a constant body temperature when you're small, then they become more po poikilothermic. They allow their body temperature to vary a little bit, but they're still endotherms. And so here's a figure from your book kind of showing an example with a hummingbird. And so it's looking at metabolic rate. So first off, you know, look at and, and think about how metabolic rate is measured. The units here are mil, uh, milliliters of oxygen per gram per hour. And so you measure how much oxygen is consumed. That oxygen, of course, is being used in cellular respiration. And so more oxygen means more respiration, means a higher metabolic rate. But, um, you know, you want this to be constant. You don't want one organism to have a higher metabolic rate just because it's bigger and so you you divide the metabolic rate 
by the weight of the organism. So you can look at a, a relative rate. And then um, you have to do it you know, over a certain time. That's why it's, it's per hour. So that's how, you know, one way that you can measure metabolic rate. And you can see that in this hummingbird, at nighttime, the metabolic rate drops way down. And we go into torpor, which is just uh, a state of, of a lethargic state or lethargy, right? So the organism lowers its meta metabolic rate, lowers its body temperature, doesn't move around much. It's just is kind of, you know, it's just kind of out of it. It just kind of sits there because... Um, it's very hard, you know, at nighttime when it's cool, um, you need extra metabolism just to maintain that body temperature and there's just not enough food. But then during the day, when you don't have to work as hard to maintain your body temperature because the sun's up, then you can crank up your metabolism and you allow your body temperature to go up a little bit. Um, at night, it would require excessive metabolism you know, to keep that body temperature up, so they allow their body temperature to go down, but consequently, they can't do as much, and so they're in this lethargic state. Now, other organisms can do this on a longer time scale. The classic example is the hibernating bear. I know this is not a picture of a hibernating bear. This is just to be funny, all right? So don't, don't go telling people this is what a bear looks like when they hibernate. But you know that the bears and lots of other organisms hibernate during the winter. And so instead of allowing your body temperature and metabolism to vary daily they do it on a seasonal scale and just when the winter when it gets cold you allow your body temperature to change and your metabolism to go down um, but you know lots of organisms hibernate during the winter and the opposite <coughs> excuse me when you slow down your metabolism and your activity when it's very hot that's called estivate and so some organisms estivate during the summer. So you're still going into torpor where you've got reduced metabolism, reduced activity, but you're doing it because it's too hot outside. And so I got a cool video about this showing lungfish and how they estivate during the hot portion of the year. And so I'm going to post this link. So take a look at this uh, video when you get a chance. Okay, so that's just some basic strategies that you're going to see in animals for regulating their temperature. Again, that's an important part of homeostasis. Um, that's all I have right now, so I will talk to you later. See ya.